Hi everybody, my name is Daniel Indrajaya. It's good to see all of you here, especially if you're visiting with us. Uh, we're so excited that you're here among us this evening. I'm so excited to uh, start this new sermon series today, but before I do, I just want to acknowledge everybody. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube, uh, listening on podcasts or watching on YouTube, we want uh, to welcome you as well. Uh, and I always say this before... Uh, the beginning of all of my messages, uh, our slogan in this church is no perfect people allowed. We believe that we are here not because we think we're better than any of you. We're here because we have received the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness uh, from Him, and we want to proclaim this message of love, grace, and forgiveness to all of you. So that's why we're here. Before we start today, I would like to lead us in a word of prayer one more time, and let us turn to the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are here among us. Your word says when two or three are gathered in your name, you are right there in the midst of us. So thank you for being here with us and thank you for every single person who is here this evening. I know you have something special to say to us, so speak to us like only you can. Help us to lay aside all the distraction and I know there's not one person who is here by coincidence. We want to listen to your word so we're ready. Speak to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with me, say amen. 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 In December 2014, a lone gunman held hostage to 10 customers and 8 employees at the Lynn Chocolate Cafe located at Martin Place in Sydney, Australia. Two people were killed and police treated the event as a terrorist attack. Fast forward a year later, November 2015, a series of coordinated terrorist attacks happened in Paris. This time, 130 people uh, died. What is interesting is the reason why we were so concerned with the events that happened in Sydney and in Paris. Maybe you think it's obvious, isn't it? It's terrorism. That's why we're so concerned with what happened in Paris what happened in Sydney, but I don't think so because terrorism happens all the time. We hear it on the news, we see it on our Facebook walls, we see images like this, the next image that I want to show you. We're so immune to these images that we don't really care about them anymore. Unless you follow the story, you will not know there are 40 people who died here, 20 people who got bombed by suicide bomber there. You will not know all the persecutions that happen all around the world. So the question is, why were we so concerned with what happened in Paris, with what happened in Sydney? I believe, unfortunately, our empathy with persecutions around the world isn't the same because Paris feels more like Australia than Middle East feels like Australia, doesn't it? The fact is, right now, Christians are being persecuted all around the world at an unprecedented rate. I want to show you a short video clip done by a professor, an Egyptian professor by the name of Raymond Ibrahim. This is actually a longer clip that I cut into two minutes just to give you an idea of what happened to Christians around the world today. Let's watch this. Which is the most persecuted religious group in the world? Which is the most persecuted religious group in the world today? The answer in terms of sheer numbers and sheer horror might surprise you. It's Christians, specifically Christians living in Muslim majority countries, countries where Christians often preceded Muslims by centuries. I'm not talking about war on Christmas type harassment. I'm talking about know your place or we're going to kill you persecution. Astonishingly, the Western mainstream media barely acknowledge what is happening. Let's look closer at this issue. It tells us a lot about the world we're living in. 100 years ago, 20% of North Africa in the Middle East, the birthplace of Christianity, was Christian. Today, Christians make up 4% of the population. Much of that decline has occurred in the last decade. In essence, Muslims are rendering North Africa and the Middle East free of Christians. Take Egypt, for example, my ancestral homeland. In just the past two years, tens of thousands of Christian cops have left Egypt. And many others want to leave, but they simply cannot afford to. Why they want to leave is no mystery. On New Year's Day, 2011, the Two Saints Church in Alexandria was bombed, leaving 23 cops dead 
and 97 injured. In recent years, dozens of Coptic churches have been attacked, many burned to the ground. In August 2013 alone, the Muslim Brotherhood and its supporters attacked and destroyed some 80 churches. Unfortunately, Egypt is more the rule than the exception. Hundreds of Nigerian churches have been destroyed in recent years, with especially deadly attacks reserved for Christmas and Easter church services, leaving dozens dead or mutilated. Churches have been bombed or burned in Iraq, Syria, and just about every place in the Middle East where churches still exist, except Israel. Christian businesses have been torched, Christian girls have been kidnapped, sold as child brides or slaves, and had acid thrown in their faces for not being veiled. Anyone born a Muslim who converts to Christianity faces jail and possibly execution. The list of fresh atrocities by Muslims against Christians grows longer almost every day. There is an organization called the Open Doors International. This is a reputable organization who's been around for 60 years. And Open Doors International reported that 2015 was the worst year in modern history for Christian persecution. And the second runner-up is 2014. 2014 was the second worst year in modern history for Christian persecution. In 2015, 7,000 Christians were executed, killed, or murdered because they were Christians. That's almost 600 Christians who died every month for their faith just because they are Christians. In 2015, over 2,400 churches were destroyed. That's almost 60 churches every week being destroyed last year. In fact, due to war and persecutions, the number of the world's displaced people right now has reached 60 million people worldwide. I want to show you a couple of photos. This is the famous uh, Yarmouk Palestinian refugee camp, uh, Damascus 2014. Uh, the next photo will show one of the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan. That's how massive it is. That's just one of them. This is another one of the Syrian refugee camp in Jordan. And here's a photo of a Syrian refugee camp um, in Turkey. And half of the 60 million displaced people were children. That means there are more displaced children all around the world then they are the whole population of Australia right now. Now, this is the world that we live in. This is the reality. This is the fact right now. And as a Christian, you need to know, I need to know how we should respond to all this. What do we do? Do we run to another country? Do we flee? Do we hide? Do we counterattack? What do we do? What is a Christian supposed to do in a world like this? More important question is how should a Christ follower respond to the current living condition that we have today? Or maybe you would want to ask the question a different way. If Jesus were alive today, what would he do? What would he tell you to do in the world that we live in today? If you're not a Christian, I'm grateful that you are here. I believe Jesus has something to say to you. And if you choose to, you can also respond the same way Jesus would want all of us as Christ followers to respond. Now, before I answer that question, I want to start from the beginning. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, the founder of our faith, Jesus Christ, Jesus, the same Jesus through whom you pray every single day, this Jesus was also persecuted. This Jesus was betrayed by his friend. This Jesus was unjustly arrested. This Jesus was illegally tried and convicted. He was flogged. And in fact, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verse 15, Mark wrote this way, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate, who was the governor of Judea at the time, he was the ruler, he released Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Do you know what flogging is? You know, we read this in the, in the Bible, and sometimes we bypass this very quickly because we don't really understand what flogging means. Flogging is usually done by two Roman centurions um, holding this piece of wood, and attached to this piece of wood is, 
is this leather strap about one and a half meter to two meter long. And attached to this leather strap are broken pieces of glasses, rusty nails, stones. And the goal, the idea of flogging is to slowly rip the skin of a person's back and a person's chest and a person's stomach one lash at a time. And this is what Pontius Pilate made the Roman centurions do to Jesus just to satisfy the crowd. To make the crowd happy, he made Jesus to be flock. The same Jesus that we worship every single week in this place. And then Matthew, who, have, who was an eyewitness to this whole thing, he wrote this way in Matthew 27, verse 28. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. I want to pause right there for a moment. I want you to feel, to imagine what that must be like to be put a crown of thorns on your head. They put a staff in his right hand, and then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him. They took the staff and struck him on the head again and again and again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him, and then they led him away to crucify him. You know why the Romans chose crucifixion? as the preferred method of punishment? You know why? Because crucifixion takes the longest for the criminals to die. Crucifixion is designed, it was not invented by the Romans, the Romans just perfected it. Crucifixion was a method of choice to punish criminals as a deterrent to everybody so that everyone can watch and everyone will not dare to cross the Romans because if you cross the Romans, this is what's going to happen to you. Two nails on the hands and two nails on the feet just to prop your body up so that you can continue to breathe, so that you can live for as long as possible until you finally have to die. This is what happened to your Savior. This is what happened to my Savior. Jesus was fearless. He was as tough as nails. When I was growing up, I saw different images of Jesus. Probably you saw images of Jesus that look something like this. This guy couldn't have pulled off what the real Jesus pulled off, let me tell you. All right? Because the Jesus of the Bible was very bold. He was as bold as hell. He was as tough as nails, and he was fearless. Let me tell you. You know how Jesus was taken to be crucified. He was not fleeing to Egypt and then he got captured and then he was crucified. He was not hiding in a hole, the same hole where King David was hiding when he was running away from Saul. Jesus was crucified because he walked right into Jerusalem knowing exactly what was going to happen to him. Jesus voluntarily, willingly, he came to this world to die for your sins and for my sins. He entered Jerusalem knowing full well this is exactly what's going to happen to him. The crucifixion, the flogging, and everything. The insult, the spitting, the punishment. And think about it. This is not some criminals we're talking about, right? This is not some child rapist. This is not a murderer. This is the Son of God. This is Jesus who's done nothing wrong in his life. But Jesus, despite being innocent, because he was fearless, he knew his mission in this world, and that is to die. To die, his mission. Can you imagine being born into this world with a mission to die? And Jesus knew that's what his calling in life is, to die for your sins and for mine. See, we got this wrong idea about Jesus, because the Bible talks about Jesus as a, a meek person, someone who is humble, someone who is soft as hard. And let me tell you, he was the softest person you've ever met in your life, probably. But he was also as tough as hell. You know, he turned 
over the money changers in the temple without any regard whatsoever for the religious leaders. He was fearless. When, remember the story of a woman who was caught in adultery? I remember that story really well. Some of you probably didn't know the story. Anyway, religious leaders of the time found this woman caught red-handed in the act of adultery. They brought her to Jesus so that they could stone her to death as the law permit them to do. And they asked permission from Jesus also to trap Jesus. And then Jesus simply stooped down, you know, just knelt down on the ground, wrote something. We didn't know what he was writing about. And then the Bible said this, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. I was talking about this to someone, and then, and then he said, It is very possible that at the time when Jesus straightened up, he was actually standing in front of that woman as if to dare the religious leaders of the time, any of you without sin, you can cast the first stone. And as he was saying that, he was standing in front of that woman. Of course, the Bible didn't say this, so we don't know if this is what exactly happened. But I'm telling telling you right now, I'm not surprised at all if that's what Jesus would do for this woman. Because Jesus was fearless. Your Savior, my Savior was bold. He was brave. He was fearless. And then this Jesus, this fearless Jesus, said to the crowd at the time, And now he's saying the same thing to you and to me. Right now, in the midst of all that's happening around our world, this is what Jesus would say to you. This is what he would say to me. He said in Luke 9 verse 23, If any of you, if any of you, that means it's open to anyone. The invitation is wide open to anyone. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. As the translation says, you must deny yourself. Deny yourself. You must turn from your selfish ways. That means from time to time, you must say no to yourself in order for you to say yes to Jesus. That means from time to time, I must say no to Daniel in order for me to say yes to Jesus. From time to time, what it means is there's going to be a conflict between what Jesus wants for me and what Daniel wants for me. It's going to be that conflict. From time to time, you will have to make that decision. Are you going to listen to you or are you going to listen to Jesus? Are you going to deny yourself and listen to Jesus or are you going to deny Jesus and listen only to you? So Jesus said, any one of you who wants to be my follower must turn from your selfish ways Take up your cross daily and follow me. Now, a lot of us read this, take up the cross daily. Yeah, I don't mind taking up the cross daily. You know, I will proudly wear my cross necklace to show people that I'm a Christian. I will put a a cross tattoo on my on my arm, on my bicep to know to let people know that I'm a follower of Christ. That's not what it means, all right? Carrying the cross doesn't mean putting a bumper sticker on your car, honk if you love Jesus. It doesn't mean that. Carrying the cross, the cross in the first century means death. It means the worst kind of death. So what Jesus is saying is this. I want you to follow me regardless. I want you to follow me regardless. Follow me when being a Christian is popular. When being a Christian is good. Follow me that that way. Fine. Right now we are like that. I think it's pretty cool to be a Christian in Australia these days. So follow me when being a Christian is popular. But... I want you to also follow me when being a Christian is not so popular. Follow me when being Christian feels safe. That's great. We feel safe right now. But Jesus says, I also want you to follow me when being a Christian is not so safe. It doesn't feel very safe. Just like our many Christian brothers and sisters around the world right now, they don't feel safe, but they still follow Jesus. Follow me when you get something out of it. You know, oh, the worship experience was great today. The song was awesome. The sermon was relevant, very practical for my life. I really needed to hear that. You know, follow me when you get something out of it, but also follow me when you get nothing out of it. When the sermon was boring, when the song was not uplifting, follow me anyway, Jesus says. 
That's what it means to follow Christ. Follow me when it helps you. Follow me also when you know it's going to hurt you. Follow me when it benefits you. But also follow me when you know it's going to cost you. Jesus says, this is what I want you to do. I want every single one of you who wants to follow me to take up your cross daily and then follow me. But Jesus, knowing everything that is happening in a man's heart, he knows exactly what's going on in your heart. He knows exactly what's going on in my heart. You know what's going on in your heart? What's going on in my heart? It's fear. It's fear. It's worry, right? We fear over our lives. We fear over our well-being. We, especially in the first world country, we are so, we make sure that everything is safe. safe. We put on our seat belt, seat belt, we put on our helmet when we ride a bicycle, and that's all great. And Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. He knew that you and I, we are risk averse, all right? And then, knowing that, this is what Jesus had to say to all of us. And this is the verse that I want to leave you with. He said this in Matthew 10, verse 28. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body, but they cannot touch your soul. Don't be afraid of those. The most they can do is just kill your body. Don't be afraid of that, Jesus says, because they can never touch your soul. Don't be afraid of anyone. The most they can do is just eliminate you, kill you, but they cannot touch your soul. If you want to fear something, Jesus said, fear this. Fear God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, you know, I have to be honest with you. I'm like you. I'm not standing here because I think I'm better than you. You know, um, all of us, like I said before, are risk averse. Uh, we have a lot of savings in the bank because we want to make sure that we retire nicely in the future. Why? Because we are afraid. We are afraid. What are we afraid of? We are afraid that when we stop working, we might not have enough for our future. And if you don't have enough, that means I might not have enough to eat. And if I don't have enough to eat, I might die. Right? Not in Australia because you can always count on the God of Centrelink. You don't have to worry about that part. But still, a lot of people think this way. i got to save, 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 save. Because if I don't save for myself, who's going to take care of me when I'm old? If I can't take care of me when I'm old, I'm going to die. And Jesus is saying to you right now, all right? Don't be afraid. The most lack of money will do to you is you're going to die physically from hunger. That's the most lack of money will do to you. But money cannot take your soul. Don't be afraid, Jesus says. Don't be afraid of anything or anyone because the most they can do is harm your body, but they cannot harm your soul. One of the church fathers, his name is Polycarp. He lived uh, from AD 69 to AD 155. And he was one of the first martyrs after the time of the apostles to be killed. And he was the direct apostle or the direct disciple of the Apostle John. Remember the Apostle John from whom we get the Gospel of John and 1, 2, 3 John in our Bible? Polycarp was his student. And Polycarp, he was the Bishop of Smyrna and he was burned at the stake and he was pierced with a spear. You know for what? For refusing to burn incense to the Roman Emperor. And what's amazing is, Polycarp knew exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. He was not afraid at all. This is exactly what he said, recorded in the book of Martyrs. 86 years I have served him, Polycarp says. So I'm guessing when he died, he was 86 years old. 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. Talking about Jesus Christ. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? 
You threaten me. Listen to this. This is beautiful. You threaten me with fire that burns for a season, and after a little while is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. In other words, this is a, an exact paraphrase of what Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who can only harm your body, but they cannot harm your soul. And Polycarp said, this fire only burned me for a while. Fire cannot touch my soul. But I'm instead fearful, if I have to be fearful at all, of the God who can destroy soul and body in hell. So, as we running this, this short sermon to a close, I want to ask you two questions this evening, okay? This, this message today seems kind of heavy because it is heavy, but I believe this is a message in season for us, not only because of what's happening around the world, but because of what's happening to us as a body of Christ, as a church in this place. We are about to move to our new location in three weeks. In fact, our first meeting in our new building will be the 1st of May. That's going to be in three weeks' time, all right? It's exciting for us, but, you know, building, at the end of the day, will remain a building, correct? Building cannot do anything to you. It cannot do anything to our mission unless you and I both make a conscientious, a willing choice, a deliberate, intentional choice to be followers of Jesus Christ. So that's why I want to leave you with these two questions. First question is this. Is your version of Christianity worth the price your Savior and others have paid to bring it to you? Let me read it to you again. Is your version of Christianity worth the price that Jesus Christ, your Savior and others, other martyrs have paid to bring it to you right now into the 21st century? Whatever your version of Christianity is, Lord, help me find my car keys. Lord, help me to get a parking spot. Bless me, protect me. Bless me, protect me. Is that worth the price that Jesus died for? And the price that all the martyrs that have gone before us have paid? You answer that question. I need to answer this question. The second question is this. Is your version of Christianity worth dying for. Now, for most of us, this won't be a problem for most of us who live in Australia. But you never know. But there are people out there who do die because of their version of Christianity. So, these are the two questions that I want to leave you with. Is your version of Christianity worth the price that your Savior has paid? Or do you only come to church when it's convenient? Do you give money when it's convenient for you? Do you serve when it's convenient? Do you only follow Christ when it's beneficial to you? Which is it? Which version of Christianity do you have? That's my question to you today. And is it worth dying for? Um, by way of uh, application, these are some of the things that we can all do as a church. All right? First thing is this. Let us all Follow Jesus regardless of whatever. Let us all learn to follow Jesus as follower of Jesus should. Carrying our cross daily. All right? Follow Jesus regardless and live a life worthy of His sacrifice. Let us all, because we only have one life to live, gang. Come on. You know, think about it with me. Jesus, our Savior, died for us and I'm sure, I'm sure. Sometimes, you know, I wonder, is there more, is there more that, 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 that I can do? Is there, is there more to Christianity than what I do every single week? I'm not asking you to, to leave everything and suddenly become a missionary in Syria or something like that. I'm just asking you to ask God. What I'm asking you right now is for you to be a little bit more serious in your walk with Jesus Christ. What I want you to do is for you to take your relationship with Jesus Christ more seriously than ever before because that's what Jesus would want you to do. That's not what I want you to do. That's what Jesus Christ would exactly want you to do. 
So let us all learn together. You and I, I'm learning as well. Follow Jesus regardless. Let us stop making excuses. Let us stop, you know, saying this and that, oh, but this, but that. No, you know, follow Christ as we meant to follow Him and live a life worthy of His sacrifice. That's the first thing. Second thing, be fearless. Be fearless. Uncertainty is unavoidable in life. Uncertainty is the only certain thing in life. We don't know what's going to happen in 2017. We don't know what's going to happen when we move to Cecil Avenue. We don't know the, the challenges. We don't know the opportunity. We don't know. But regardless of what it is, I want you all to be fearless. Can we all do that? Can we all be fearless when we move to Cannington and say, God, this is, we're going to take this territory. You have given us this land. We're going to occupy this land. You know, we're not doing this like uh, as, as someone who's like, you know, with swagger and all that. No, but we're going to take our position in Cannington and be the lighthouse, be the blessing that God wants us to be as a church because the church is the hope of the world. The church is the hope of Cannington. I had a meeting with uh, the mayor of Canning, the mayor of Canning uh, two days ago, yesterday actually. And we had a long conversation, over three hours. And we talk about the city. We talk about the challenges uh, in the city. And I was so excited that the mayor was excited that we are in the area. And, and I, I plan to continue the conversation with the mayor and see what we can do together. And I, I don't know if you know, but the mayor of the city of Canning, he's also a Christian brother. And I'm so excited. I don't think that's by coincidence. You know, any people didn't think he was going to win the election, but he won by the slide. And... As long as we are in the area, whether the government is good or bad, God says we got to plug in. we got to get plugged in and bless the city. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Let us be fearless uh, because uncertainty is unavoidable, but fear is optional. All right? Fear is optional. You can be fearless because your soul is secure in God. You know, uh, let me explain a little bit because fear is a feeling. You know, I, I, I believe from time to time you will, fear, you will feel fearful. From time to time, I feel fearful. So there's nothing wrong with that, right? We're afraid of things from time to time. I'm afraid of height. And I hate to admit that, but it's true. Okay? So fear is a feeling. So you can't help it when it comes. But you have a choice. You have a choice whether or not you live in this constant state of fear and, and, and it grips you and it, 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 it freezes you to the point that you can't do anything, or you can choose to say, no, nah, I, I feel the fear, but I know it's optional. I know whatever it is that I'm fearful of, nothing can touch my soul. The most it can do is harm my body, but nothing can harm my soul because if in Jesus Christ, my soul is secure in Him. And then number three, finally, let us spread the message of love and not hate. Let us spread the message of love and not hate. You know, it is very easy for us when we hear all this news about all this persecution, for us to feel like, man, you know, we feel like retaliating, right? We feel like, God, just strike them dead. God, just do something. God, please, you know, I, don't you care? Do you know what's going on with all these persecutions around the world? You know, sometimes I feel like God is, is, is so helpless. But let me tell you, God is not helpless. Jesus, when He was on that cross, He looked down to all those people, the Roman soldiers, the Jewish leaders who gave Him up. And He said to His Father, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Because they know not what they do. Forgive them. Because they know not what they do. The message of Christianity is the message of peace, forgiveness, and love. As difficult as it is for us to apply, and I'm telling you, it is hell extremely difficult knowing exactly what's happening with our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. But combating hate with hate is not going to solve the problem. Fighting hate with hate is not going to solve anything. If anything, we need to do the exact opposite. We need to love and we need to forgive. In closing, I want to show you this short video clip. This is the story of Miriam. Miriam 
is an, an Iraqi Christian girl. Obviously, she speaks Arabic, and, and growing up in Indonesia, I, under, I actually understand some of the words that she used. Um, it's amazing. But it's an amazing story of what happened to, again, our brothers and sisters around the world. And her story is just one story that I've heard over and over and over again how Christians in these persecuted areas responded to the atrocities, to the persecution that they experienced in their own family. And I hope we can learn something from this girl. Let's watch this and then I will come back and conclude. واحنا موجودين هنا في المخيم لقينا بنوته فوجئت ان هي بتقول ان هي بتفرج على ليش هيك واسمها مريم ازيك يا مريم زينه انت كيفك انا زي الفل انت بتفرج على ليش هيك فعلا ايوه حبي سات 7 كيدز ايه انت فين بلدك جاي من قراقوش برضو ايوه من قراقوش انا طيب انت عندك 10 سنين مش كده ايوه طيب قولي لي انت بقى لك قد ايه هنا في المخيم اربع اشهر ايه اكتر حاجه انت حاسه ان هي كنت بتحبيها في كراكوش مش موجوده هنا دلوقتي في المخيم كان عندنا بيت وكنا متونسين بس يعني هنا ما متونسين بس الحمد لله يعني الله سترنا قصدك ايه يعني ايه الله سترنا يعني الله حب حبنا و... وما قبل يعني يقتلونا داعش طيب انت حاسه قد ايه ربنا بيحبك صح ايوه ربنا بيحبنا كلنا مو ب... مو بس انا كل الناس يحبوهم الله وانت شايفه ان ربنا كمان بيحب الناس اللي ممكن تبقى اذتك وزعلتك ولا لا بيحبوهم بس ما يحب الشيطان طب انت شايفه انت حاسه بايه ناحيه الناس اللي ممكن تبقى خرجتك من البيت و... وتعبتك ما راح اسويهم ولا شيء بس يعني اقول ل... لله يسامحهم وانت تقدري تسامحيهم كمان؟ ايوه بس دي حاجة صعبة قوي ولا حاجة سهلة ان انا اعرف اسامح الناس اللي تعبتني يا مريم ما راح اقتلهم يعني ليه اقتلهم بس بس زعلانة ليه طلعوني من بيتنا طلعونا من بيتنا طيب آآ آآ انت كنت بتحب المدرسة في كراكوش صح؟ ايوه وكنت أولى دايما كان عندك اصحاب كمان في المدرسة؟ ايوه موجودين هنا معاكي ولا مفيش ولا حد فيهم هنا؟ اكو بس ما بس ما اعرف وينهم طيب لو يمكن يكونوا هم دلوقتي بيتفرجوا على التلفزيون بيشوفوا سات 7 كيدز تحبي تقولي لهم حاجه؟ كان عندي صديقه واذا هوني كان عندي صديقه اسمها ساندرا وكنا انا وهي كل اليوم مع بعضنا وكل المدرسه مع بعضنا مع بعضنا مع انه كنا بعيدين ببيوتنا مع من من بعض بس كنا نحب بعضنا كثير يعني إذا هي غلطت علي وأنا غلطت عليها نسامح بعضنا ومرات كنا نلعب ونغلط على بعض بعض بس نسامح بعضنا وكنا نحب بعضنا بس هسه أريد أشوفها شوف بس أنت مش عارفة هي فين خالص صح؟ ما لا ما أعرف وينها طيب هي لو ساندرا بتفرج علينا دلوقتي أكيد هي كمان بعتلك سلامات و... وأكيد هي كمان بتحبك يا مريم بيني كثير وأنا حتى أحبها ويا ريت أشوفها يوم أكيد ونفسي كمان إحنا نبقى معاكي في اليوم ده علوة يعني إيه؟ يعني علوة أرجع آه نرجع على بيوتنا هي ترجع على بيتها ونشوف بعضنا وترجعوا كمان في بيت أحلى من البيت الأولاني كيف الله؟ ما كيفنا نحن كيف الله هو اللي يعرف طيب أنت مش بيجي لك وقت كده تبقي زعلانة بتحسي إن يسوع سابك مثلا؟ مرات يعني ابكي على البيت مالتنا ابكي على قراقوش بس ما ازعل انه الله يعني سابنا من قراقوش يعني رحنا من قراقوش اشكره لانه سترنا وجابنا لنا حتى اذا متبهدلين هنا بس الحمد لله الله سترنا انت علمتيني حاجات كثير قوي شكرا و... وانت حتى علمتني علمتك ايه انا علمتني يعني ما علمتني يعني حس حسيت بمشاعري حسيت بمشاعري انا كان عندي مشاعر واريد يعني يعرفون الناس ايش هي مشاعر هذول الاطفال اللي هنا 
وانت عارفه ان يسوع مش هيسيبك ابدا صح؟ ما راح يسيبنا اذا مؤمنه وثابته بينه ما راح يسيبني طيب قولي لي انت فاكره ترنيمه او فاكره حاجه لما بتبقي قاعده لوحدك كده بتحبي ترنميها او تكلمي يسوع بيها ولا مش فاكره ولا حاجه خالص؟ عندي ترا عندي ترانيم طب تحبي تقولي اكتر واحده انت بتحبيها؟ تبقى صغيره وقصيره بس نسمعها منك ايه رايك؟ اكو واحده is one of the 30 million kids displaced all around the world right now. She has a much better version of Christianity than I have, that's for sure. That's for sure. But the good news is, we don't have to stay where we are. We can get better. We have to be better. Because people, our brothers and sisters all around the world, died. For the version of Christianity, we should enjoy the freedom, the comfort that God gives us in this country. By all means, enjoy it. It's a blessing. It's a privilege. Don't go out looking for trouble just for the sake of suffering for Christ. I'm not advising you to do that. Don't be an obnoxious Christian just so that you will be persecuted. That's not the message. But I think. We have to look at our version of Christianity and see if it is what Jesus is calling us to be. Follow me. Denying yourself. Stop being selfish. Instead, take up the cross and follow Him. Jesus took up His cross for you and for me. This is not a guilt trip because salvation is for free. It is by grace alone that you and I are saved. It is not by works. No one can boast. But following Christ has a high price to, to pay for us. Because your salvation is not the end of your journey as a Christian. It's only the beginning. After God saved you by His grace, then what? Then what? Then our life is now meant to be lived for the glory of God, for Christ alone. Amen? And that's why I believe God gave us that piece of land in Cannington. That's why I believe we have a big mission ahead of us. But that takes a different brand of Christianity if we want to be successful in accomplishing the mission that God has given us. We can't be fearful Christians anymore. We can't be soft Christians anymore. We can't be Christians with excuses anymore. Only serving God, only coming to church, only giving when it's comfortable for us. But regardless of what it is, I have to deny myself and follow Christ every single day. Let's bow our head. Father, we thank you for the story of Miriam. 
Lord, that's just one, just one of thousands upon thousands of stories that we have heard. And the name may be different, the place may be different, but the message is the same. This were fearless brothers and sisters in Christ that we had. People who died for their faith just because they were Christians, just because they were your followers. Father, I pray for myself and for everybody in this church. Lord, I pray that we will take our Christianity seriously. Father, we, we want to be grateful and we want to enjoy all the blessings that you have given us. Lord, we trust, we believe all the blessings that we enjoy come from you. And there's a reason why you gave us all those blessings. But Father, help us also to understand what is your overall plan for this world through our lives. What is your plan for our church? Father, help us individually as a body of Christ in this place for us to to take this seriously and follow you wherever you want us to go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all the blessings. Thank you for all the opportunity. Thank you for, for the forgiveness that is always available regardless how far we fall, regardless how, how, how often we sometimes ignore the call that you have given into our, in, in our lives. You always, always accept us back into your fold, into your fellowship. Thank you, Lord. So I pray for every single person, every single family in this place, Lord, that, that we will take up the challenge that you have given us and do what you want us to do in our world, where we are, in our office, in our school, in our, in our uh, location in Cannington. Lord, wherever you call us, may we be shining so brightly so that people will know that you are our Savior. And we are serious about following you. We're not just playing here. Lord, we are your follower. We will take up the cross and follow you. Church, why don't you stand on your feet right now? It is a custom in our church for us to, to go and receive the blessings from God. If you need any prayer, if you uh, have something to share, maybe even good news that you want to share with, with, with our prayer team, please come forward after the prayer of blessing. These prayer warriors would love to pray for you. They would love to intercede on your behalf. So please don't be shy. Just come forward. And parents, we have a meeting right after this with the, the kids' leaders in this, in this church. So please don't go home right away. I think meal will be provided. So uh, stay behind if you have already signed up. Or maybe if you haven't signed up, maybe you can uh, ask the leaders if you can stay back as well because it's going to be a very, very useful information for you. But uh, let us go from this place and receive God's blessings. blessings, shall we? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always wherever you go. Even though today's message is heavy, may you go from this place full of joy because you know your Savior loves you unconditionally. Because you know, even though people can harm your body, they cannot harm your soul. Your soul is secure in Jesus Christ. May you go from this place and take up your place and win this world for Jesus Christ. For, forgive your enemies. Love them as Jesus Christ has loved you. And may your Father in heaven be glorified through your actions, both now until Christ comes again, even forevermore. And all God's people who are blessed, say together with me, Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Go and be fearless.